Good evening. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Becky. I'm one of the librarians at Storrs Library in Longmeadow, Massachusetts. I'm very excited to welcome Senator Eric Lesser here today for our virtual forum. Thank you everyone for joining us and thank you Senator Lesser. Um, this program is being recorded um, and we're very excited to offer it to anybody who's not able to join us today. Um, please feel free to chime in with your questions and comments. Um, and Senator Lesser, is there anything you'd like to say to get started? Well, thanks. Thanks for having me, Becky. And uh, and I just want to say thank you really first to Stores Library. Uh, I'm a big Stores Library fan. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, during a kind of more normal period, uh, I was a regular, certainly a regular customer, as were my two daughters, uh, are my, uh, as are my two daughters. Um, there was one day we joked that I believe one Saturday, Rose was in the library three different times with three different members of her family. Uh, I brought her in the morning. Uh, my wife brought her. Uh, in the uh, afternoon, and I think my mom snuck a visit in with her in the middle of the day also. So we're big users uh, of Stores Library and big fans of the public library system. And I just want to also say, you know, as we move forward and we begin to recover, hopefully soon from the COVID pandemic, our libraries are going to play a very important part in that recovery, uh, because at the heart of the mission of free public libraries, is uh, access to knowledge. Uh, and there's an important social justice and economic justice element to that mission. And uh, libraries may get reimagined and retooled a little bit over the years to come. And we're certainly gonna be partners with you in that work, uh, but um, you're gonna be an essential part of that future for our Commonwealth. And I'll just quickly plug the library caucus that I chair uh, in the legislature. I'm the Senate chair of uh, the Libraries Caucus. So people might ask, what is the Libraries Caucus? Well, it's it's pretty simple concept. We get all of the legislators from all over the state who care about public libraries together, and we uh, advocate for libraries. Uh, and so we advocate for library funding, for library construction, for investment in our public library system. And I'm very proud to say that Massachusetts actually has one of the strongest public library systems in the whole country. Uh, and just recently, we celebrated the opening of the East Forest Park branch of the Springfield Library, very close to us, of course, here in Longmeadow. Uh, and we're going to be hopefully opening many more libraries and, um, and re rehabbing and restoring and renovating libraries uh, in, the, in the years to come. So with that, my, my guess is people probably have a lot of questions uh, just about the state of the world and, um, and the state of finances. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get into that. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, so I'd like to open it up um, to anybody. I have um, some prepared questions, but I really wanted to give the opportunity um, for our audience, for our participants um, to ask questions. This program is for you. Um, so I don't have anything in the chat box yet. You should be able to unmute yourself. Um, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask a question or submit it to us via chat, I'd be happy um, to help manage that. Doesn't look like we have anybody unmuted with a question yet, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so here in Longmeadow, the school year, and I know across the state, the school year just started. Um, and you, know, you mentioned briefly um, at the beginning about you know, all of the changes, all of the adaptations. Um, what can the state look to, both in our area and statewide, um, with the school year just starting, what changes to expect and how to adapt to that? Yeah, so uh, first, this is unlike any school year we've ever had, and uh, I include myself in that category. Uh, my daughter Rose is in second grade, and we just finished day two uh, from the kitchen uh, of, uh, of doing second grade. Uh, and I just want to say, you know, the, the teachers and the school system, you know, have really just done a, a heroic amount of work uh, under really very, very hard circumstances. And, you know, I want to celebrate the teachers and the school officials, the principals uh, that, that have worked so hard to, to get us to this point. But I also really do want to thank the parents. Uh, I know that there's a lot on parents right now. Uh, they're juggling, many people have lost their jobs. Uh, because of the COVID epidemic, many are concerned about the future of their jobs. Many are juggling their own schedules and their own challenges in this period, while at the same time, they're, they're now uh, teaching their kids at home. <laughs> so it's a, it's a hard time, uh, and, I, and I appreciate and understand how hard that time is. I do think moving forward, you know, I really view my role as being an advocate for our community and working to lift our community in terms of what they need from the state to be successful. So we know uh, our schools need PPE, 
We know they need uh, equipment to make the school safe, uh, whether that's protective equipment, whether that's investments in the physical plant of the school. Several uh, schools in my district uh, need ventilation upgrades. Uh, so we're gonna be working with the state on funding those ventilation improvements. We need health infrastructure around the schools to support contact tracing and testing regimes. So we're gonna continue to fund that. Uh, and we're gonna make sure that kids are safe, uh, but the goal does need to be uh, to get kids back into school. Uh, I think it has to be done safely. No one, uh, and I certainly would never put my own children at risk and nobody is gonna ask uh, their child to be uh, in, a, in a dangerous situation, but the North Star needs to be making the investments and doing the work we need to do to get kids back into school in as close to a normal environment as we can hope in a safe way. Uh, that needs to be the goal and that's what we're gonna work towards. Uh, and so that's gonna be a whole community effort. So I really view the efforts around school reopening as, as very tightly connected to our other efforts around keeping the virus levels very low, uh, around continuing to invest in testing and contact tracing. And then again, getting the support to families uh, and, to, and to our uh, education professionals so that we can get things hopefully moving in the direction of back to normal. Thank you. Um, so I know different towns, different cities um, in our area and across the region um, have all different types of models They're, that they've adapted to get kids back into school. Some hybrid models, some uh, completely virtual. Um, what do you see happening? What efforts being made um, to maybe make a more consistent experience or to address the yeah. discrepancies that are there? Yeah, so uh, I, I think I, I sort of acknowledge and I know and I, I'm, I'm seeing Jennifer from my office, you know, this has been a, a source of frustration for families uh, and, I, and I'm very empathetic to that. Uh, as a working family myself, I obviously work full time. My wife works full time. We have two very young kids um, and we have a lot of support and we have a lot of help and it's still uh, a very big burden. So families are really in a hard spot right now uh, and I, I think empathy in a situation like this is very important. Uh, but what I would say is, is a couple of things. So first, um, DESE on a state level put statewide guidance out to all of the school systems in the state about criteria that needed to be followed for schools to reopen. Um, it's very important for people to appreciate that was not passed by the legislature. Uh, that, was not, uh, that was not brought forward in a traditional kind of legislative framework. That was done under the governor's emergency powers from the emergency order that was invoked in March. So it was very top down in the sense that it came from the governor and his administration and from the Department of uh, Education to the schools. Um, they did make several rounds of changes uh, to feedback that we provided, that the legislature provided, and that schools provided. Um, but the ultimate um, result was some districts had a better ability uh, to meet those guidelines than others, and, and other districts made local decisions based on their own unique circumstances in their districts about whether it was appropriate to have a fully remote model, a hybrid model, or a fully back-to-school model. Um, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I believe the majority of students in the state right now are under a remote, uh, a basically completely remote model. Certainly the biggest districts in the state, Boston, Worcester, Springfield, Holyoke, Cambridge, Brookline are in 100% remote models, uh, but the majority of individual districts uh, are in a hybrid model. So that can be misleading depending on what number you're looking at, right? Because there's over, well, there's over 200 districts, uh, but you know, majority of the students are actually in a, a relatively small number of those districts. So a majority of the individual districts right now are in a hybrid model. Uh, I believe a majority of the students, however, uh, are in a remote only model. Um, so our hope is, is just to continue to monitor the, 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 health, the health process and, be, and continue to get support to those districts so that as it's safe, we can transition uh, back to, um, to in person. But again, Becky, I've really got to stress all of this is really dependent on the virus numbers, which is why we need people to continue to be vigilant about social distancing. We need people to be vigilant about mask wearing. You know, now I kind of say, wear your mask so that our kids can get back to school. 
uh, because if we wear our masks and the numbers stay low, it will be safe for kids to get back. But if the numbers are not kept very low, it, it's not going to be safe. So all of these issues are really interrelated with each other and need to be viewed uh, in, a, in a holistic whole. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned a moment ago that as far as the school guidelines, it was a very top down um, has that been widespread the last few months or is that starting to change in any way with education or with other fields? Yeah, so it's an interesting, I mean, you know, the lawyer in me uh, is sort of fascinated by the situation we're in, which is, uh, you know, we've got, uh, we're operating under a state of emergency. Uh, the state of emergency gives very wide discretion to the governor, um, really almost dictatorial style powers. Uh, and I, you know, I, I don't use that term lightly, but that is how the law is designed. In fact, the history of the Acts of 1950, which is the law that we're operating under, under were actually written in preparation for a potential nuclear attack uh, in 1950 at the beginning of the Cold War. So there's pretty broad powers there. The legislature has been working in collaboration though with the governor and we've passed dozens of pieces of legislation since March uh, tied to the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, we passed an over billion dollar supplemental uh, appropriation over the summer, uh, early in the summer, to surge resources to communities. When the virus was first beginning in very early March, we sped through an emergency authorization to fund uh, contact tracing and public health and uh, healthcare efforts for frontline healthcare workers. Uh, I'm the author of a, a major uh, economic rescue package called the Endure Act, which we're uh, approaching finalizing and will be on the governor's desk hopefully very soon. So we're in a very busy period of legislative making. Um, we've held dozens of hearings in the legislature to collect testimony and feedback uh, from, from impacted sectors uh, around the crisis, and we're working our way through it. Uh, but it, it is a very, very challenging time. Uh, but what we need people and what we need the community really doing is communicating with us about what they need. Uh, it's not bothering me. Reach out to me. Uh, tell me what you need uh, and what you're hearing, and we will do our best to be your voice and to be your advocate uh, on Beacon Hill. Thank you. Um, we have a question um, in the chat. Um, when does an emergency end and we accept that this is the way things will be for a while? Um, it's, it's, uh, the comment is, it seems much of the balance of work of the state government, read, um, the budget has stopped. Uh, okay, <laughs> so a lot, good, 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 lot of things to unpack there. So, why, why don't I start with the work? The, the work of the legislature is ongoing uh, and uh, and is very much. We have never stopped. So, uh, to just to just give you know my office for example, we are operating in a remote way. The the state house had several positive cases early. Uh, in the epidemic back in the spring and a decision was made to move to a remote model, except sessions are still happening um, and sessions are happening in person in a, in, a, in a limited kind of prescribed way so that there's not crowding um, and it's done in a safe way. But we have been meeting um, nonstop since the uh, coronavirus started. And in fact, in a normal year, in an even numbered year, in an election year, normally the legislature goes out of session on July 31. We suspended that rule this year, of course, so that we would be meeting in continuous session uh, as long as we need to, to be able to respond in a, in a real time way to, to issues on the ground as they present themselves. As it, as it relates to the budget, and I see uh, Mark Gold from our Board of Selectmen here, who we've been in a lot of touch with over the, always are in close touch with, but have been in a lot of touch with during COVID-19. Um, we, we've made a conscious decision in Massachusetts to not operate under a normal fiscal year budget picture. And I think that that was the right decision. Uh, and it was the decision that the virus dictated. And it's going to give us a lot more flexibility and tools, frankly, in responding to the virus and to the economic crisis we're dealing with as it evolves. So the governor, the House, and the Senate, the three stools of the budget writing process have been working in collaboration on doing month to month budgets. So we've been taking it one month at a time. Uh, and so far we've been able to keep level budgets, um, which means we've stayed at the 2019 fiscal levels, which has been a big help for our towns uh, and for our schools. Uh, because even though we've seen dramatic declines in the economy, because we're taking it 
bit by bit. We've been able to incorporate aid from FEMA. We've been able to incorporate aid from the CARES Act as it comes in. Uh, we've been able to triage areas where the virus is maybe worse and places where it isn't. And it's given us the flexibility to maintain funding and support levels on an even basis. So we are right now operating on a, um, on a, on a sustained budget through October 31. Uh, our hope is, is in the next few weeks, we're gonna have more clarity around both what the virus picture looks like, but also very importantly on what any potential federal aid would look like. Um, and we can begin to put a budget together for the remainder of the fiscal year uh, through July vision um, that was made to help manage this crisis in real time. Quite frankly, if we had been forced to make a year, a year long budget decision back in March, April, May, which is when our normal budget calendar is, the budget would have been cut dramatically because that was where the projections were at that time. So I think it was the right decision to take it piece by piece. Luckily in Massachusetts, we've got people working together in common cause. We, we make decisions based on evidence and data. Um, and, and we've been doing that in a collaborative way again with all the major branches, you know, sort of steering in the, in the right direction. To answer the first part of that question about when do we get back to normal? When do we get back to, you know, that raises an interesting question about when or how the state of emergency gets lifted. Um, in other states, you've actually seen legislatures challenge those, those emergency declarations. Uh, I don't think we're gonna do that in the near term in Massachusetts. Uh, the governor's team has been responsive to us when we raise issues. Uh, I have a regular calls with his um, cabinet secretaries, uh, his labor secretary on unemployment, his economic development secretary on the coronavirus response and the, and the business reopening plans, his health and human services secretary on the virus response. So, you know, we are working in a collaborative way. Um, we have made adjustments here and there uh, to the emergency order based on laws we've passed. So, um, you know, I think the virus, frankly, is going to dictate that. Um, this is definitely an, un, an unprecedented situation uh, on, in, on, a, on a lot of levels. I don't think anybody envisioned when they wrote the um, emergency declarations that they, it would be six months long, <laughs> let alone, um, you know, moving, moving into the future. But I think it would probably be um, in, not, it would not be prudent right now. Uh, for us to change that dynamic. Uh, the, the emergency orders are there and the emergency powers are there for a reason. Um, in a crisis, you need the executive operating quickly and in a responsive way and those powers give them the ability to do that. But we're gonna, we're gonna maintain oversight and we have maintained oversight. Um, I hosted, for example, um, several reopening hearings around the governor's reopening plans they're not perfect by any means, um, the plans, uh, and we've shared that uh, and we've made that clear where appropriate. But, um, you know, I think in terms of dramatically moving in and changing the emergency powers is not something I think we would be doing in the near term. Great, thank you so much. Uh, you mentioned, you know, incorporating some of the CARES uh, funding um, as part of the plan to not have a whole fiscal year right now. Um, what the, uh, the CARES Act is as a, Huge, um, huge package. Um, so can you tell us a little bit of, about how um, it affects our state, our communities, um, or maybe some things that maybe people uh, might not be as aware of, things that haven't been publicized as much um, that affect us? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> well, the CARES Act, of course, is federal law. Uh, so it's probably better to ask, you know, Richie Neal or Ed Markey or Elizabeth Warren. Uh, they could probably get into more detail about it than I can. Uh, but I will kind of tell you a little bit about the sort of interface with state government, which we've been very familiar with. So, um, uh, you know, really across the board, it's been absolutely essential. Uh, you know, there's, there's a very kind of technical way, for example, Medicaid is paid for, uh, Mass Health uh, is paid for through a combination of federal reimbursement and state add-ons. And Massachusetts is a state that's, that's comparatively very generous with what we supplement uh, federal Medicaid funding with. But for example, even relatively small changes to that federal formula can have dramatic budget consequences for the state because mass health is such a big part of the state budget. So the CARES Act gave significant add-ons to what's called FMAP, which is federal uh, Med Medicaid assistance plans, um, which has allowed us, for example, to offer uh, free coronavirus testing 
uh, for mass health patients. It's allowed us actually to offer a free stop the spread testing, free no questions asked coronavirus testing in at-risk communities. Um, that's money that's largely come uh, through the federal government. Uh, also, uh, there's some very, very important funding in there uh, for uh, example, for community development block grants. So you've seen, for example, some of the grants that have been given out, especially in Springfield to uh, local restaurants. Uh, a lot of that has come through CARES Act uh, money. Uh, so really just across the board, I mean, you name it and there's been uh, really probably an important element that can be traced back to the CARES Act. Of course, the most significant pieces for the public have been the PPP uh, loan programs, the, the uh, low interest loan programs, and ultimately hopefully grant programs for small businesses. And then very importantly is the $600 uh, supplemental UI uh, program and the pandemic unemployment assistance, which is an important program not everybody I think appreciates, which is if you're a gig worker, an Uber driver, uh, a, a, pian a concert, that you know anyone from an uber driver to a lyft driver to a task rabbit person you know someone doing uh stuff on task rabbit to someone working uh, gigs as a as a wedding singer you know if you weren't paying into the ui system you weren't eligible for any unemployment insurance and when the pandemic hit a lot of those jobs were totally wiped out people would have been destitute uh, without an emergency program. The Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program created a new unemployment insurance system, you know, virtually overnight for what we call gig workers. Uh, and I think it, it just sort of indicates that in the future, we need comprehensive work around re reimagining how our work insurance programs operate in the 21st century. We need portable benefits for our workers. Uh, we need to do a lot more around universal health insurance. The idea that in the middle of a pandemic, people are struggling to find health insurance. They're struggling with uh, medical bills from coronavirus treatments, I think is inexcusable. So there's a lot more that needs to happen. But the CARES Act was a very, very important piece of legislation for us. And it took a lot of work on a state level, frankly, to unpack and implement you know, the federal government handed the state of Massachusetts this huge thing <laughs> and basically said, you implement it. Uh, and so it was an immense amount of work uh, to unpack that, to get that out to the public, and then very importantly, to make sure that the community knew what they were eligible for, um, especially in terms of, uh, around unemployment insurance. Right, thank you. Um, so earlier, um, you mentioned the Endure Act, the, um, I believe it's Encourage New Development, and the recovering economy. Um, can you detail any of the plans, any of the goals or actions or a timeline for us? Yeah, so the Endure Act is really, in many respects, our um, sort of first step uh, at uh, recovering and rebuild, first stopping the bleeding that's in our economy right now, and then beginning the process of recovering. Uh, and one of the things I said on the floor of the Senate is after, after presenting the legislation, which my committee that I chaired, the Economic Development Committee wrote, is, you know, when, the, when coronavirus first struck, we knew we had to flatten the virus curve. Uh, but what I think we've all really come to appreciate and really understand is that there's a second curve that also needs to be flattened, which is a curve of skyrocketing inequality uh, and injustice. And th this bill is really about flattening that second curve. Uh, and, and, and to just give you a perspective on this, there are over 16,000 restaurants in Massachusetts. Already today, as we talk, 20% of those restaurants have already closed permanently. More than 3,000 small businesses. Uh, our service sector, uh, our hourly wage workforce has been decimated. 40% of, uh, of uh, hourly workers at small businesses in the state have lost their jobs. Um, the scale of the suffering uh, is, is unlike anything any of us on this call have seen in our lifetime. Um, Massachusetts has more than a 16% unemployment rate, one of the highest in the country. Um, in February, it was under 3% in certain parts of the state. And the unemployment rate in our, in our black and brown communities, in our immigrant communities, in our gateway cities is significantly higher than that. So we have urgent work to do. Um, and the reality of it is, is that 
you know, the, I, there's an instinct I think we have to say, we, we just need to get back to where we were. We need to get back to normal. We need to get back to life in January or February. Uh, but the reality of it is, is the way our society was working, even before coronavirus was, was deeply unfair uh, and, and, and deeply unjust in a lot of respects. And I would say, I would include Western mass in that in terms of geographic inequality. And so the goal here is to not only rebuild, but to rebuild in a better, more sustainable, more fair way moving forward. So we have uh, a new micro uh, business uh, uh, grant program for the smallest kind of community oriented businesses that have been the most hurt by coronavirus with a special focus on black and brown owned businesses and businesses in our gateway cities, businesses in our immigrant communities um, that we know have been uh, the, the most directly impacted. We have a new rescue fund for restaurants to try to keep our family owned restaurants operating uh, and alive uh, during this very difficult time. We have <clears throat> uh, a very important program for our tur tourism industry, the third largest industry in Massachusetts by workforce to keep them alive, to keep them supported as we, as we get through uh, this, this pandemic. We have a student loan bill of rights to help make sure that students and their families who collectively in Massachusetts owe um, over $40 billion in pending student loan debt are protected uh, and not taken advantage of. We have work, we have efforts in there to protect tipped workers. So um, it's, it's really a, a historic package. Uh, when you look at the scale of it, it would, it would really change the trajectory of our state in a lot of ways if, if fully implemented. Um, I would really encourage people to check it out. I mean, we can share the links uh, to the to the to the speech unveiling it and to the bill, um, and it passed. It passed the Senate. Uh, a very good version also passed the House. We're in negotiations now to reconcile those two different versions, and that's going to be uh, hopefully put in front of the governor's desk very soon. Right. Thank you. Um, we do have a question in the chat. Um, it's um, there's a scenario behind it, so I'm just it might take a moment to read. Um, so Massachusetts is one of a few states participating in the windfall elimination provisions affecting workers who wor work both in the municipal sector as well as in the private sector. Um, the, um, this participant um, has um, their spouse uh, worked for the city for many years and then it was absorbed um, into a private group um, when the company changed. Um, so no longer a public payroll employee, um, but has been contributing to Social Security um, for several years since that transition. Um, if the job had not shifted, uh, her pension would be very different. Um, it would have allowed a pension 80%, um, which it's only at 31% because of that transition. Um, taking that into consideration, um, you know, the benefits you know, are adjusted downward. Is there anything she can investigate that might be full, more fair and for seniors who have worked in both sectors, um, Massachusetts involvement is punitive. Can relief occur at the state level? Uh, that, that does sound, that situation does sound very unfair. Um, it's probably best to follow up with us uh, offline so we, we can just get a little bit of the particulars of that case and see what we can help with. So just reach out to myself and Jennifer, who's also uh, on the call, Jennifer Metz from my office, and we can look into that. I mean, I, I, I believe if you're talking about the provision around Social Security, I believe that that's a federal law. Uh, and, and, and so we might need to work with our federal delegation on that. But, um, you know, again, without kind of knowing the very specifics of that case, it's probably best for us to talk about that offline. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And I will, um, in a moment, I'll get um, your contact information from your website and put that in the chat for participants. Yeah, it's very easy. It's eric.lesser at masenate.gov. Uh, just eric.lesser at masenate.gov. If you go to senatorlesser.com, there's also a form on there, but the form just emails me. So uh, you can either fill out that form or you can uh, email us at eric.lesser at masenate.gov. Thank you so much. Um, and I do want to remind everyone, you're welcome to unmute yourselves and ask questions if you'd like. Um, you could also raise your hand um, and I can kind of select you if that would be easier. Um, so please feel welcome um, to jump in. Um, so, so, Senator, you've talked a lot about, um, you've mentioned a lot about um, inequality and a lot of the issues that we face socially. So I kind of uh, want to bring up um, something that you worked on over the summer, um, the Reform Shift and Build Act. Um, 
uh, can you just uh, talk about what that is and what the plans are to do it um, and what other plans might be going forward? Yeah, so uh, so the idea behind the Reform, Shift, and Build Act is is really is really really an important concept and frankly a, a simple concept in the sense that <clears throat> we need to we, we need to reform and reorient our, our criminal justice system and our policing system a, a, against one of really a warrior mentality with communities and one of partnership with communities and so it's it's really about for example taking some of the most aggressive and, and frankly counterproductive police practices and, and trying to reorient and redirect that energy towards community supports, social supports, um, and community policing, which we know works. So uh, the bill does a lot of things. Uh, some of the most important things is, for example, it would ban chokeholds. Uh, there would be very, very narrow exceptions, really, if there's imminent life uh, uh, at, um, at threat. It limits the use, for example, of tear gas. We've seen uh, frankly, the abuse of some of these very aggressive tactics uh, around the country, um, and it would begin to reform elements of qualified immunity, uh, which is a legal doctrine that has really made it almost impossible uh, for citizens to um, be able to get accountability from the most really aggressive and and inexcusable forms of, of police violence and police brutality. So um, it's a very important bill. Um, it, was, it was certainly uh, inspired in part by what we've seen in, in Minneapolis and in, and in other places around the country. Uh, but I think it's important, Becky, also for us to acknowledge that it's, it, it's too easy for us to point at Ferguson or Baltimore or Minneapolis and say that those are issues in other places and in other states. We have these issues here in Massachusetts, in our own communities. Uh, and the Department of Justice just this summer uh, put forward a, a really important, really frankly, a historic report uh, on the Narcotics Bureau, for example, um, in the Springfield Police Department that documented a pattern and practice of abuse. Uh, and we, I think, have a moral obligation to do everything we can uh, to ensure that people trying to fix those issues and people trying to make those issues better are empowered with the law on their side. And that's really what this bill is about. Uh, and that's what this work is going to be about in the months uh, and the years ahead. Thank you. Um, so I guess while that comes forward, while you're working on next steps, what do you have recommendations for, for the people here, for the people who will watch this, um, what steps they can take to, um, to see the problems that, that do exist here and to help take steps to change it, not, not wait for legislature, not wait for bigger yeah. or more tragic events? So, I mean, I, you know, I just first, we've seen just, just, just such an outpouring of, uh, of civic engagement uh, just in the last several months. You know, I think the coronavirus, uh, the murder of George Floyd, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, all of these you know, powerful social movements that are happening around the country and in our own community right now, I think are evidence of the fact that you know, the stakes are just so high. Uh, I mean, we can't afford not to be engaged in our community and to be engaged in these issues. And we're, we're in a historic time. Uh, this is not a normal time. Uh, we're in a once in a century pandemic. We're in a really not since the 1960s have you seen the same level of focus on civil rights and on, um, and on racial justice issues. And you know, I think people need to um, work in their own life and in their own communities and in their own circles on change. Uh, it's not just enough, frankly, to point at your elected officials in Boston or in Washington and say, change this. P everyone needs to be part of the change. And one of the things I say, you know, as your senator, as your representative, as your advocate is, I'm only as effective as the community I, I represent. So we need to hear from you. We need you involved. Um, join a movement, join a march, join uh, a cause that you feel passionate about and get out there and work. You know, Becky, the, the first time I got involved really in politics, I was in Longmeadow. I was a high school student. I was 16 years old and there was a round of budget cuts um, because of a recession. And I remember Mr. Birdie, the high school principal, called us into an auditorium at the Long Middle High, the old Long Middle High School auditorium. Um, and he said that there were going to be several dozen teachers that were going to be get, getting laid off and that weren't going to be coming back to the school system after the summer break. 
And he talked about how there were science programs that were going to get cut, academic programs, sports programs, music programs. And I remember sitting there angry that 14 and 15 and 16 year olds were being asked to pay the price for bad decisions, you know, that had been made somewhere else. So, uh, you know, we, but we, we, we organized, uh, we went out and we put a campaign together. We knocked on every single door in town um, to try to do something about it. And I, I was lucky that as a 16 year old, I was able to experience the positive change that's possible um, through action in politics and through mobilization in your community. And I hope that if anything positive can come out of what we've all been through, you know, over the last six months, it's a belief that positive change is possible if you work for it and if you organize for it. Uh, and I've seen that with the young people that have reached out to me, uh, with the young people that I've, I've seen at the Black Lives Matter uh, marches and protests, the young people, or not just young people, but the people that have reached out to me with really important ideas uh, about how to respond to coronavirus. And, you know, frankly, it doesn't all have to be political. Um, you know, I, I see in our community, just for example, just look at, look at the work. I mean, look at the spirit behind trying to make remote work or remote school, you know, a positive experience for our kids. I mean, I think about my daughter's principal. I mean, the email, she's sending emails in the middle of the night, um, you know, just the amount of work. I mean, just if you're feeling down or you're feeling like, um, you know, the world is sort of cascading in on itself here um, and it's normal, I think, I think it would be odd if we didn't have that feeling every once in a while these days. Think about the helpers, you know, like what Mr. Rogers used to say uh, and the people that are really working on positive change and, and get energy from that. That's great, thank you. Um, and as you've said already, um, a lot of this is overlapping. A lot of this um, you know, is, is not um, siloed. They, they are connected in all different communities and all different parts of life. Um, so I'd like to maybe talk a little bit more about some of those aspects you've talked about um, some of the um, economic efforts. I, I would like to maybe talk about some of the bills from this year, um, possibly before um, the pandemic, but um, working through them. You've mentioned a couple of them yourself um, already. Um, portable benefits for independent workers, the best made program um, that you've had a hand in, an entrepreneur's learner's permit program. Can you talk about some of those projects? And yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so I mean, you know, really my, my whole time really uh, in office, and I, I, I'm now running for my fourth term, my fourth two-year term, uh, and uh, uh, I was elected in 2014 um, at 29 years old, but the, my whole time in, in office really has been around Look, I have, a, I have an interesting district, actually, Becky. I mean, we're in Longmeadow right now. We're, we're doing a stores library for it. But actually, kind of the magic of Zoom is that people can watch it from anywhere. Um, I've got a, a really interesting district. I represent nine communities. I represent some of the wealthiest parts of the state and some of the poorest. I represent some of the most densely populated parts of the state. And I have towns I represent that don't have a, stop, a, a, a traffic light. Uh, I represent, um, you know, uh, I represent communities that have, you know, a tier one, we have a tier one academic medical center. Uh, and we also have one of the largest Air Force Reserve bases in the country. It's a very diverse district. We've got farms, we've got uh, big apartment complexes and everything in between. Uh, but one thing that really unites all corners of my district and all the communities I represent is this sense that your their kids and grandkids are not gonna have the same opportunities here in Western Mass that they or their parents had. And that was really um, kind of, and has been the animating principle of my work, which is lifting our communities and making sure that every family, uh, whether they live in rural Western Mass or one of our cities in Western Mass or one of our suburbs or really anywhere in between, uh, has the chance to live out their full opportunity. That's why we fought for rail service, connecting Western Mass 
with Eastern Mass. It's why we've championed manufacturing, which we know has been an engine of middle-class growth in our communities for a century. I chair our manufacturing caucus. It's why we've worked to bring the life sciences industry and all of the opportunity that life sciences offer, offers for good jobs and breakthroughs in research to Springfield, to Greenfield, to our communities here in Western Mass so that people don't have to travel to Dana-Farber or to Mass General to get a cutting edge uh, clinical trial research work. They can get that done right here. It's why we've partnered with our community colleges on precision manufacturing initiatives. It's why we've worked to lift up our libraries, chairing the Libraries Caucus, because we know the role libraries play in empowering communities. So I would say, you know, the animating principle of my work before coronavirus is the same thing that animates my work in current during coronavirus and will be the same thing that animates my work after coronavirus, which is lifting our communities and making sure that, frankly, a lot of us in Western Mass who have been left out of the explosive growth we've seen in the Boston area in the last 15, 20 years, that we can participate in that growth too. And so I would just say, you know, Vicki, just not to belabor this, but looking into the future, there's actually a lot of reasons for optimism. Mm -hmm. um, take the trend on remote work. You know, we were talking, I, I had a remote work bill. One of the bills in the list that you were describing was a remote work incentive we filed more than two years ago uh, to try to promote more remote work in Western Mass. Well, now the whole world uh, is working remotely. This has tremendous potential for us in Western Mass. Look, we had the quality of life. We have the good schools. We have the good cultural assets. We have the affordable lifestyle. What we were lacking in Western Mass was the access to the jobs. Well, now we Senator Lesser, I think you cut out for a moment there. Senator Lesser, we, I still can't hear you. Uh, let me see. The screen is gone too. Yeah, the froze on us. Welcome to internet digital divide here even in Longmeadow. It looks like he might have left, so we're just going to give him a moment to come back. Sometimes that's right. So quick. <laughs> thank you for your patience, everyone. Yes, thank you. I'm texting him. Okay. I'm sure he's coming back. Becky, thank you for setting this up. This is great. Oh, you're Very welcome. Fun. It's my pleasure. He's trying to connect to the audio now. Okay. Yeah, I just saw him pop back in. Great. There I am. Thank you. Welcome back. Just when it was getting good. <laughs> <laughs> We're just saying there's a digital divide even in Long Meadow. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, I think you got the point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so to build on that, um, one of um, one of the bills that you've had. Um, is the Massachusetts Future of Work Commission, which seems to focus specifically on technology. Um, can you maybe build on what you were saying and um, elaborate on um, that commission as well and its role? Yeah, so the, the idea really here is um, probably not since the Industrial Revolution uh, 100 years ago has the nature of work changed more uh, than it has in the last few years and certainly will now in response to the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And so the idea behind that legislation is really let's get the, the leaders of our Commonwealth, the, the, the biggest thinkers, the people who are most involved in kind of charting the future for us uh, around work, work policy together to think through how we reimagine uh, our workplace policies for the 21st century. Because the reality of it is, is that our unemployment insurance system, our healthcare system, our worker benefit structures are still based on, frankly, a 19th century model of industrial employment where you would clock in at 9 a.m., clock out at 5 p.m., work five days a week and collect a pension and healthcare all along the way. Unfortunately, that's not uh, the world we live in anymore and that's not our situation 
um, in our economy. So let's reimagine uh, how we create good benefits for people, how we create security for people um, in, a, in a very different world of work. Uh, and so that really at its heart is what that commission is about. That's what that proposal is about. It's included in the Endure Act, the Economic Development Bill we were talking about earlier in the session. So hopefully if the Endure Act passes, um, that, that element will be included as well. Okay, great. Um, we did have one or two people join right around when you came back. So um, just for anybody who just joined us, you're welcome to unmute yourself if you have questions. Um, certainly chime in. This is, uh, this is for you. It's why we're here. Uh, you're also welcome to use the chat box if you prefer that or if um, you don't have a camera or mic. Um, it is being recorded, um, just so that you're aware. Um, and I'll give you a moment um, and um, move on with some other questions. Um, we've talked um, a little bit about healthcare as well, and part of that is the inequity, um, but also um, just filling in some of the gaps. So there's a, a few things from over the summer that I saw some, some news um, features of yours, um, the Patients First Act, the Maternal Health Care Package, and the limiting the use of step therapy. So along with the economy, the healthcare has been a big uh, focus in the last few months as well. Um, <laughs> Which makes sense. Uh, can you elaborate on any of that for everyone? Yeah, well, um, you know, so some of that is admittedly probably on on pause a little bit just because of the just the dislocation that the healthcare sector is in right now because of the coronavirus pandemic and certainly, uh, you know, the frontline needs of containing the virus and getting the spread under control um, has to be uh, our focus at the moment. But but in the in the medium term. You know, we, we um, there's really three ways to, th I kind of think about healthcare in terms of three key elements, right? There's access to healthcare. Um, there's the quality of the healthcare once people have access, and then there's the cost of that healthcare. Um, in Massachusetts, we do a decently good job around access. Um, you know, we have the highest insurance rate uh, in the country um, by far, actually. We have a lot of work we need to do in terms of getting access to underserved populations, populations that still don't have coverage. Um, I am a firm believer in continuing to expand out mass health, for example, um, you know, continuing to move towards a public option, uh, for example, with mass health for, for private insurance. But access is, is one key metric. Um, but then the other important metric is quality. Uh, we need to make sure that not only do people have insurance and that they have healthcare coverage, but that that coverage is of a very high quality. Um, it's not that helpful to you if you have a serious illness and you're not getting access to the best doctors uh, and to the uh, and to the best treatment that you can um, that you can. In Massachusetts, we we have the best healthcare in the world, uh, bar none. We have the best hospitals in the world, the best research centers. But again, the balance between the high quality and the access is not there. We don't have enough access. Um, to the to those high quality services for everyone, and then the final piece is cost. And we do a terrible job on cost. It's too expensive. Even people who have health insurance have very high deductibles, uh, and um, and on and struggle um, to pay. We have issues around surprise medical billing, which is a big problem. We have issues around phantom billing. Um, it's just too expensive, uh, and we need to get the cost way down. So, you know, I tend to think about healthcare policy in terms of those three elements, you know, access, quality, and cost. And we've got work to do on all of them. I think the most urgent work we've got is, is around cost. And so we've done a lot of initiatives, and a lot of what you've pointed out uh, is tied to reducing the cost of health care. One important initiative I've spent a lot of time on is bulk purchasing for our prescriptions. Uh, prescription drugs are, are too high. We did, uh, we created, I created a law uh, to set up a new bulk purchasing program for Narcan. Uh, this we did at the height of the opioid epidemic in 2015. And then I wrote a subsequent law, which was passed and the governor signed uh, to create a bulk purchasing program for EpiPens, which brought the price of EpiPens down significantly in the state. So we've got a lot more work to do on that. Um, and then the other bill you pointed out, uh, the, 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 uh, one of the major bills we did uh, over the uh, last fall was around mental health parity. Uh, this is an issue I feel very passionately about. My mom is a clinical social worker, has been for uh, several decades in Holyoke. And uh, we have big problems in the sense that we don't have parity yet between mental health care services and physical health care services. And there's still a lot of ingrained bias against mental health coverage in how our insurance system works, how our health care system works, and we need to work to address that. 
Thank you so much. Um, so it's about 7.25, so I have one more topic that I'd like to ask about. And again, uh, audience is certainly welcome um, with their questions and comments. Um, so it's election season. Uh, we had our primaries just a couple of weeks ago, um, and then um, obviously another election in November. Um, one topic that has, been, has come up a lot is um, mail-in or absentee ballots. And I know Massachusetts has uh, made some changes this year. Um, is that something that you can um, talk about briefly? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a very a big believer in increasing ballot access. Uh, I was a, a co-sponsor of the automatic voter registration ballot, uh, or excuse me, a, a voter change that we did two years ago, um, which actually has helped get us to a place where we now had 1.7 million ballots cast in the 2020 primary that just happened a few weeks ago. Record turnout you would have to go back decades to find uh, a comparable turnout to what we saw uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, I was the lead uh, Senate sponsor of a, of a, there were, there were several different vote by mail um, uh, bills that were presented. I was the lead sponsor of the, of the kind of consensus uh, uh, bill that was put forward and we wrote in conjunction with Common Cause, Mass Voter Roundtable, League of um, uh, a League of Women Voters and several other uh, voting rights groups that we worked on on that legislation. Uh, we saw record turnout as a result of that vote by mail process. And actually there was a major article in the New York Times that pointed to the Massachusetts law as one of the examples of a vote by mail system that really worked uh, and, and allowed things to be done safely. Um, our system uh, allows multiple options for people. So you can still vote in person if that's your preference or if you just forget until the last day. I personally like voting in person. Um, you know, I'm an elected official, so it's kind of my habit. I'm superstitious. I like to go to the ballot box and, and vote. And that's how I did it this year. I wore my mask and I went in. I got to say that the Longmeadow poll workers did an incredible job. Our town clerk did an incredible job making it safe, um, you know, enforcing uh, social distancing in a really good way. So people can still vote in person. We then expanded very dramatically what was called um, early vote location. So in-person voting we did for uh, 10 days leading up to the primary. We're gonna be doing it for two weeks leading up to the general election in November. And then of course, we had the mail-in option which was available really for a month uh, leading up to election day. The idea behind this is first, because of coronavirus, we had to do it because we've got to reduce the lines at polling places. I point out, you know, Wisconsin, the Wisconsin primary, there were actually two dozen COVID cases that were traced to people who were waiting in line for the elections in Wisconsin. We saw the long lines in Georgia during their primary. We don't want that in Massachusetts. So um, the idea here is to reduce the crowding and reduce the lines because of COVID. Um, but also, frankly, to make it um, more accessible for people uh, and to do it in a secure and safe way um, that makes sure we don't have fraud. Um, that, that's all very uh, important. And we did that. Um, it you know, wasn't perfect. Nothing is perfect. There's things to work on and improve uh, from the primary. But I do feel very good about where we are in Massachusetts for the general election. Great. And um, as far as... Um the state, the what people will be voting on that is affected directly in the state. Um, I found um, two big issues, the right to repair and the ranked choice voting. Um, could you uh, maybe just talk about them a little bit so people understand what they're voting on and if there's anything else they should be aware of for the upcoming November election? Yeah, well, there's this big, there's this big thing coming up that uh, people might have to make a decision on. I mean, I, I'm voting for Joe Biden. I'm not shy about uh, about getting that out. I know this obviously isn't a, a partisan uh, a, a partisan panel, but um, we could talk about that another time. But I'm I'm feeling good about that election. Although we've got to stay focused on that. Uh, in terms of the ballot referendums, you know. Though those are for you to decide, you know, and for the public to decide, not me. I mean, those are those are ballot referendums. Those aren't uh, questions for the legislature. But there's two important ones um, that are going to be on the ballot. You mentioned the right to repair, which is around um, the right to have access to the uh, data that's collected um, when you get your, you know, when your car repaired at the shop. Now they do those plug-in 
know, those plug-in diagnostics of, of cars now, um, an interesting issue. Uh, people should, should, you know, read up on that and, and be prepared. Uh, actually, interestingly, they just came out because I just got mine in the mail, but Secretary Galvin just sent out the red uh, voter information booklets that people should take some time to read uh, because they, in a, in a non-partisan, objective way, give the kind of uh, different different elements to consider on the ballot referendums. And then the second very, very interesting and very big one is uh, the ranked choice voting question, uh, which is whether for uh, state elections, we would move to a ranked choice voting system uh, for picking uh, candidates in elections. And that's an interesting uh, model. Um, it's one I, I personally am, am, am interested in and do personally support. But again, this is for people to decide on their own. Uh, and um, the idea behind a ranked choice voting system is our current system is all or nothing. So if six people are running in a primary, for example, you pick one. Um, and so what could end up happening in a system like that is, you know, a person could win with less than 30% of the vote, which means the majority of people actually preferred someone else. That's the system we've always had. Some people defend that system, some people don't. That's the way it works. Um, what ranked choice voting would do is it would change that one choice system to a ranking. So you would have a first choice, a second choice, a third choice. And then there would, there would be a system where if your first choice gets eliminated, then your second choice would move up to be your preference. And so the idea is, is that you can, in a multi-candidate election, uh, you can pick out um, you know, basically you can rank order, you can rank choice your candidates uh, by order of preference. Less relevant for general elections, which tend to be one versus one, you know, so in that op choice, op obviously you're only picking two, but in, um, in, in elections where you have a lot of candidates running for the same office, um, it, it, could be a, it could be a way to more clearly articulate a preference. Great, thank you for kind of just giving us a few more details on it. And again, as Senator Lesser said, um, please look for those booklets in the mail um, to read up on them in a nonpartisan way um, so that uh, come election day in November um, or in your absentee ballots when you submit them uh, to make an informed decision that is best for you. Um, I'd like to just check one more time, see if anybody has any final thoughts or questions. Again, you're welcome to unmute yourself or raise your hand or to enter it in the chat box. Um, I don't have any questions in the chat waiting. Um, and just while we give it a moment, I wanna thank you, Senator Lesser, um, for taking the time to sit with us and to answer our questions, to kind of talk uh, about the world around us, about our communities uh, right now. And um, it, it's very helpful to just to hear through it and to get some, some extra information and extra insight. Um, and really appreciate you being available um, to your constituents, to the public uh, and working with us so closely. Well, thank you, Becky. And, you know, I just want to say, you know, thanks to you. Thanks to Stores Library. Um, you know, we didn't even get a chance to for some light conversation about books and stuff, but uh, uh, I've got a, I've got a stack of books I'm working I'm working through right now. Um, one one benefit, I guess, of, of all the lockdowns and of, uh, you know, and of um, and of the world we're in right now is I've been able to get a lot more reading done than I normally do. So uh, really appreciate uh, appreciate you, and I appreciate everything that Stores Library is doing. And I and I just want to say thank you to our community. Um, this has been a really a really challenging time for everyone, and uh, I've just been really so inspired by our constituents. Um, and you know, they reach out to us morning, noon, and night, and I, we love it. Uh, we love hearing from everyone. Um, not everyone, but we love hearing from most, mo <laughs> almost everyone. And uh, and uh, I just want to just say thank you to to everyone, and um, and I you know I hope everyone's staying safe and uh, and that their families are doing okay. Senator Lesser, it's Don Crate. I just want to say um, thank you for your hard work and your dedication to our community. Um, I was involved in Zoom calls all day. I've been on Zoom calls since 7.30 this morning for the love of God. I've, enough. <laughs> this is what I've done. Um, but I was, I was intrigued by the conversation today with, I forget who hosted it, um, the school lunches and and the in the feeding our community. And oh, the uh, the uh, food systems caucus we did with uh, Ann Gobi and uh, and Joe Comerford. Yes, that yeah. was that was fascinating to me. Um, was there anything on that that was surprising to you? 
Oh, well, I, I, we were, we were putting it on. So, uh, so, um, you know, a lot of that was about trying to get the word out to the community about, you know, just how frankly desperate the need is. Um, so, you know, a lot of that has been issues we've been working on for the, for the last several months, really the last several years, but I, you know, just to repeat for everybody else before we say goodnight is, um, you know, I don't think people realize the important role schools play in food policy, uh, because, um, we have, tens of thousands of students, hundreds of thousands of students in the state who are getting breakfast and lunch, and in many cases, dinner from their school. Uh, and, and if the um, school is not open in the traditional sense, certainly the remote learning is happening, but if the school is not open to serve those meals, um, you have a human, frankly, you have a humanitarian crisis because um, there will, for some kids, it's not a big deal. They, they get the meal from somewhere else. Their families have the means, but not for a lot of kids. Um, and especially we have children from very disadvantaged backgrounds, from immigrant families, from um, very low income families where, where they really do rely on these meals. So um, I don't know if people do appreciate the scale of the logistical challenge of getting thousands and thousands of bre meals, breakfast, lunch, and again, in many cases, dinner too. And then there are weekend meal programs. Also, we have programs where we give, um, we give extra meals on Fridays for kids to take home for the weekend. Um, getting that out to students um, in March, in April, in May, over the summer, and now as the new school year has begun, has been a, a massive logistical undertaking. So, you know, I just want to, I want to, you know, we, we, we have the issue in Longmeadow too. Uh, we have a lot of students even in, in Longmeadow that, that have this need. And I, I want to thank the school department, Superintendent O'Shea, um, that made this a priority. And I want to thank our, our neighboring districts that I represent also. Uh, we've worked closely with them. Springfield is, is delivering thousands of meals a day. Um, to, to students um, every single day. Um, in some cases, there were school districts where they had, um, they followed the school bus routes and they were dropping the meals at the houses along the school bus routes where they would normally be picking kids up uh, to get the food out. And then there was another interesting issue, just, just again, I think people would be fascinated by this, you know, local farms. In Western Mass, we have all of these incredible local farms. I mean, we could just start naming them. Um, you know, the farms, you know, Red Fire Farm in Granby, Meadowbrook Farm in East Long Meadow. Um, you know, the list, the, list, the list goes on and on. Randall's Farm in Ludlow. Um, you know, that maybe we're supplying in institutional suppliers. So a, a farm was providing milk to the UMass Dining Services, for example. Well, all of a sudden, the thousands of students that they were feeding at those dining halls you know, in March and April are gone. Uh, what do you do with those eggs? What do you do with that milk that's still being produced at these farms? Well, they, they were at, it, go, it goes bad if you don't use it quickly. They were at risk of having to dump it. We saw those horrific stories nationally of farms that were ripping up fields because restaurants were closed. There was an immense mobilization to get that food to food pantries, to get that food repackaged, repurposed, redistributed. Um, the Food Bank of Western Mass, I hosted Andrew Morehouse, a, a close friend of mine who does incredible work for the Food Bank of Western Mass uh, on my own live stream where he talked about the logistics of just getting that fresh food off those farms and into food pantries so that they can get to people who need it um, and that it didn't it didn't go to waste again you know just back to our point Becky it's like look to the helpers it's like if you're feeling down <laughs> uh, or you're feeling uh, a lack of empowerment right now uh, I mean, look, look at what members of our community are doing, you know, and, 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 and you don't have to, you can be part of that too. I mean, you can go help at the food pantry. You can go support one of the farm's efforts. You can help with the school meal distributions um, and, and you can be part of that solution as well. I love the bank that said that they just said to their employees, look, you can just work at a food bank and we'll pay you as a bank. That was incredible. Yeah, they were closed anyway. Yeah, exactly. It was beautiful. Yeah, it was great. Uh, thanks, Don. Yeah, it's good. Good to see you. <laughs> you so I think that um, is about it. I don't have any other questions. So unless um, 
I don't see any hands raised, so I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you again, um, everyone, for joining us online, um, for being flexible and adapting as we all have the last few months. And again, thank you to Senator Lesser and to his office um, for working with us and to help make this happen. Um, oh, take thank care. You. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Becky. Thank you.